Woohoo! Welcome, everyone. Hello, hello. Good evening. G'day, g'day. Everyone's streaming into the room. It takes a little while for Zoom to catch up. We're going to get started in about 30 seconds. So now's the time to get your notepad and your pen, a glass of water, or your cuppa. Till and I got our cuppas ready. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's bang on the minute. So we are already recording and streaming. So welcome, everyone. My name is Regen Ray, and I'm from Farming Secrets and the Soil Learning Centre. I uh, just want to welcome everyone here to tonight, our information webinar in regards to the MetaFarms project. So now's a great time to turn on your camera. We love seeing everyone and nodding. And uh, if you feel comfortable, feel, feel free to uh, turn on your, your camera and so we can see you smiling. Um, and uh, we'll manage the muting of everyone. So welcome everyone, give a wave if you've got your camera unway, uh, open. And in the chat, I'd be very curious to know where you're coming from, where you're joining us from. Always nice to see where people are joining us from. Brian, you look like you're in a hospital bed, so hopefully you're doing well. Oh, that, yes, that's right, we spoke about that. Welcome, thank you for making it from the hospital bed. <laughs> Excellent, well, welcome everyone, Till. I'll, uh, Throw over to you to say hello um, as everyone streams in. I'll make, you, make sure everything is streaming live to everything. Yeah, g'day everyone. Uh, not too sure what else to say. Where we are, where's everyone from? Sydney, nice, we're in Sydney at the moment, down in Redfern. We've got Melbourne, nice. Awesome, we're good, we're on all the platforms. So welcome everyone. Um, tonight, we're going to uh, take you through the entire kind of process of what uh, MetaFarms is all about. There's going to be maybe some new words that you're learning. We're going to take you through all the numbers. Um, so tonight's going to be really an information. We're going to have time for questions at the end, um, but put your questions in the chat so I can curate them uh, as the night goes along. And that'll be the best way to uh, kind of get your questions. And it helps us not answer the same question over and over. So yeah, one minute past, uh, let's jump into the content. It is jam packed, I've seen the slides. There's um, really good diagrams to hopefully articulate the way that this works. We understand this is a bit of a new idea and concept for many. So we really tried to make it um, as constructive as possible to get the message across and make everyone feel comfortable with what we're uh, putting forward. So on that note, over to you, Till. Um, I'll let you, um, oh no, I'm gonna share a video first, aren't I? <laughs> Let me get that video up. So one of the um one of the things we wanted to do is just play this video in regards to Bricklet. So Bricklet is the um the company that we've decided to work with in order to help manage this process of uh, co-owning. Um, and the reason why we we wanted to work with Bricklet is because they've been doing it for so long, and it's a tested and 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 um, proven kind of model. And so we're not reinventing any wheels here. We're just plugging into a system that already uh, is in place. And we're on their website the other day, we saw this video and we thought this is a really good uh, video that kind of capsulates someone's experience firsthand. So I'll share my screen and share it with sound and thumbs up till if you can see that black window. Awesome, all right, this is a quick 30 second video. So it won't take long. This is from a Bricklet customer. We wanted to, but we never invested in property because the risk was way too high for us, considering that we would have to take out a large piece of debt and then put all that debt into one property. We just didn't feel comfortable with that. I actually really like the idea of bricklets that it allowed people to uh, you know, break up the title of a property over time. It would enable us to diversify the investment. So still be property investing, but not having to put all that money into one property. Awesome. So that's, you know, just a little bit of a um, little snippet from someone who's been through the Bricklet model and understands uh, that. And so we just wanted to share that uh, for everyone tonight. Um, maybe you're, you know, the difference is we're doing it for farmland. So this is, you know, a bit of a first and we're really excited to kind of be pioneering in this space. So over to you, Till. Thank you so much. Sounds good. Can you see that? Perfect. Yeah, I guess 
Um, what the Brickley customer said is it really goes back to, um, I guess the, the issue we have around buying farmland, it's, you know, take a massive amounts of debt and most of the time, you know, a couple of million dollars just as a deposit to get into it. And then you're not stuck, but then you only have one, um, property or an investment. And so you can't really diversify in that sense. So we'll, we will be discussing a lot more about the uh, the individual farm aspects. Um, last uh, webinar, we talked a bit more about the Bricklet model and, and how uh, we can be using that to invest in, in farmland. So if you're interested at any stage during the webinar, feel free to uh, sign up for our expression of interest. That just lets us know that you're uh, interested. I'm sure a lot of you guys are already um, have put in your expression of interest from last webinar, but if you're new and this is your first webinar, um, check that out. Otherwise, um, we're Meta Farms. Uh, we are passionate about regenerating farms and, and we want to bring everyone uh, with us on this journey. And so that's really why we're using uh, the Bricklet model to have this community owned and um, yeah, community owned farm. Before we get into, I guess, a bit more of the nitty gritty stuff, it is important to note that this is not financial advice. We're not financial advisors. We're purely just showing you guys a um, an opportunity uh, and the educational side of that and expanding your knowledge on, on what is out there. If you are con uh, considering buying farmland or uh, Bricklet uh, through Bricklet, always talk to a trusted and financial advisor. So just to cover the Bricklet model, Pretty much the Bricklet model breaks up, I guess, the ownership um, structure and allows multiple people on title. So you can say there we have a farm, we have the deed for that farm, and then on that deed, we've got multiple owners. And so that's in the form of Bricklets. So one person can own any amount of the Bricklets, um, and that's owned by the owners. And so you're pretty much directly owning uh, the farm, which is which is a bit different to uh, owning a unit in a trust, which owns a farm, or owning a, a unit in a um, or a share in, in a company. This is on on title, and so when we have one uh, bricklet, that is one unit of ownership uh, in the farm. This is pretty much how we have adapted uh, the bricklet model to farm uh, to farming, and so you have the bricklet owners. They um they're on the deed, which owns. Uh, which is part of the farm. The farm is then leased out to Metafarm um, or a daughter company of Metafarm to operate. Now that will uh, involve a lease and a lease payment back to the owners of around 3% of the total uh, bricklet uh, raise amount. Now it is important to note we are using regen uh, principles, which we will talk about a bit later. And the whole thing about Regent Ag is that we're building soil fertility and we're building um, the health of the farm. And so with that, we're going to be um, expecting to increase the productivity of the farm, um, which should force appreciation of the farm too. And we'll talk about this a little bit later um, as to how uh, production affects the uh, value of the property. Um, otherwise, we have this kind of background land appreciation for that area. The New South Wales 20 average for farmland is around 8%. Uh, the Armadale area is actually 9.4%, and that's the last 20 years um, average. And so you, you can already say that farmland is um, pretty good uh, in terms of its um, ability to appreciate and value. In terms of um, how the lease gets paid out, it's it's a 3% um, payment on the total amount that the bricklet um, raises. And so that's divvied up across uh, the owners in proportion to the amount of bricklets you own. So for example, if the initial raise is $800, um, that is $100 per bricklet, would have a lease of $24 and then $3 gets divvied up across everyone. And so you can see there that person four has, I think four bricklets. So that would get four lots of, of threes. In the case that someone wants to sell, and this is a really interesting and, and cool thing about Bricklet, is that you can sell your Bricklet on the Bricklet marketplace uh, to someone else. And so that improves liquidity um, and I guess, exit strategy if you, if you need to or, or have to sell. And so the way this works is that you just list your Bricklet on, uh, it's almost like a Facebook marketplace, eBay kind of um, place. And then um, a person that's interested in buying 
uh, a bricklet can then purchase it from you at a, at a agreed price. So then you would just list your bricklet, say, for $110, and then that person would either buy it if, they, if they're happy with that price or, or just simply they won't. So this is what the, um, I guess, bricklet marketplace looks like. So you have all the stats about the bricklet, uh, the property value, and then uh, below this page is a little bit more detail about um, the property. And so we're currently getting um, our own page designed up uh, from Bricklet uh, to show pretty much Meta Farm and the farm that we'll be looking at today. Back to the last webinar, there's a lot of um, benefits that we get from farmland. Some of the main ones is that we, we've been getting these really market beating returns. Um, and in, in the scheme of things, it's quite uh, low volatile. I wouldn't say low risk uh, because volatility and, and risk um, are, are different. But if you don't want your assets, I guess, to bounce around and you just want a, uh, almost like a, a smooth slope, farmland is uh, a really good uh, investment for that. So you can see from the, the diagram from Acre Trader, farmland has a pretty low volatility, but really good um, returns. It's also inflation hedged. And at the moment, um, inflation is set to peak, uh, I think, greater than 7% uh, by the end of the year. And so if, if you're worried about your uh, purchasing power being eroded away due to inflation, farmland is a great um, choice to protect your purchasing power as the incomes from farmland are protected uh, from inflation. As if, if you're selling you know, beef, that is usually what gets inflated. And so therefore it's, it's protected. Something that we didn't talk about last webinar is that farmland is usually um, has a very low correlation to other markets. And so this graph here is also from AcreTrader. Um, this is, uh, I guess, American markets. But really, this just shows that it has a very low correlation. So when the market goes up, it's really unpredictable to say what farmland is doing. And so this is really important if you want to um, minimise the volatility of the overall portfolio. In terms of what we're I guess, doing for meta farms and, and the options, we have a, a number of different options depending on the number of people interested and the number of bricklets reserved. So we got a an option that we'll be talking about today, which is our uh, maximum option. So if we raise the uh, the full amount, we'll be going with uh, this option. Well, we have options all the way down to um, our, our lowest uh, or smallest farm, which is about um, 500 uh, hectares. And so if you are, again, interested in, in uh, expressing to us that you're interested in buying a bricklet and being an owner in a farm or a regenerative farm, uh, just go to our website at buymetafarm.com and, and you'll see the prompts there. Cool. So um, next for, I guess, uh, Metafarms is that we have the expression of interest, which will then lead into a brick, bricklet uh, commitment. And so that involves um, anyone interested setting up their Bricklet account and um, transferring $1,000 into that account. Now that is 100% uh, refundable and it just tells us that you are actually serious about buying uh, a Bricklet. And then when the, the time comes for the confirmation date, um, we will requ uh, require you to uh, pay another $14,000 um, one and a half thousand dollars into the account to make up the um, full bricklet uh, cost. Again, all that is 100% refundable. And if there's no sediment, all of that is refundable. So what do we look uh, what do we look at when buying a farm? So for me, I look at firstly things we can't change. That is topography, uh, the soil, climate and natural water. These are the things that we'll never be able to change. We also look at things we can change, but uh, like you don't really want to. Maybe perhaps it's a high capital expenditure um, or it's just a lot of hassle. And that includes um, most of the sheds, the yards, a lot of the fencing, uh, water, irrigation dams and pastures to some extent. This, the things that we can't change, that determines uh, your enterprise. So if you've got a really hilly country, you're not going to be able to drive a tractor over it and do broad acre cropping. It might be better for cattle. And the things that uh, we can change, but it would be nice if we didn't, that usually determines how quickly we can start operating and the capacity of the farm. Next, we look at things that we can change. Uh, this leads to value-add opportunities and improvements. 
So these include our current operations, minor fencing, minor repairs, soil degradation, things that we can fix and that we can fix slowly over time to increase the value of the property. We can also look at vegetation and pastures. We also want to look at current operation and the carry capacity of the land. This usually um, lets us know the productivity of the land. And then lastly, we want to be looking at price. Now, price is a funny thing because it can it can be a really good price, but if the value is not there, it, it's a like it's a poor uh, investment or choice to buy um, the farm. So you can have a really productive farm, but it'll be the wrong price, and so it's not not the um, the right buying decision. So we've got to factor all of that in and come up with a good price for that. So our first option is Karajong Park, which is. 2,078 hectares of grazing country in the New England area. Ray and I have gone out to this farm. It's um, my background picture, picture you can see there. It is um, pretty open and it's also the uh, video we have playing on our website. So if you go to our website and you can see the, the video playing um, there, that is uh, Karajong Park. In terms of location, it is... Uh, about an hour and a half north uh, east of uh, Tamworth. It's about 40 minutes away from Armadale and 20 minutes uh, west of Urala. So it's um, it's not too far away. Um, I mean, from from Sydney, it's a it's a bit of a trek, but it's it's not in the middle of nowhere, which is really ideal when we're talking about, I guess, um, trying to find a a really good manager that's um, and allowing us to have access to a, a wider market in terms of um, hiring. Top, uh, topography, flat, uh, undulating and hilly. We have a, a pretty large hill, which you can see in the paddock Mount uh, Baldy. There's um, a river um, going through the property, which is in that area pretty flat. And then we have some undulating hills um, to the uh, bottom left. Um, some of the paddocks are um, we're able to sow some some crops into it. So uh, the oats paddock and uh, some of the paddocks in the top left corner. Some of the other other paddocks, which are a bit more hilly, we won't be able to do that. It's mostly for grazing. In terms of climate, it's a pretty high rainfall uh, area uh, with an average rainfall of seven hundred and seventy five to eight hundred and twenty five mils. Uh, per year. It's a subtropical climate, which means we get a lot more uh, rain during uh, the, the summer and less in uh, the winter. Soil types, we have um, mostly uh, red trap soils and red um, basalt soils. So that's high fertility soils um, and uh, the, uh, the trap soils are generally low to medium uh, fertility. And we also have rutasols, uh, candesols, um, and curasols. In terms of the uh, the paddocks and the water sources, it's divided up uh, into 33 paddocks of ranging sizes. There's 58 dams. I think it, uh, there's I think the minimum is two. I think dams each paddock. There's um, a bore and rainwater for the houses. Oh, and there's uh, also the honeysuckle creek flowing through uh, the property, which is, um, if you can see my mouse, it's flowing just through there. Infrastructure. Now, this is pretty important if we want to start operating as soon as possible. Uh, Karajong Park is set to go pretty much from um, settlement. And so that includes machinery shed, workshop, um, feed shed, um, cattle yards, which will be pretty important, sheep yards and shearing shed. Now, we won't be uh, looking too much into shearing. Uh, personally, I, I'd prefer cattle and um, self-shedding sheep, but um, Ray, Ray might have some uh, different um, ideas about that. But generally, this this will be used mostly for cattle, and that's what the current uh, owner is doing as well. So this is some pictures of the infrastructure. We've got two houses, the main homestead and the manager's um, house. We've got some uh, pretty large uh, sheds and um, the cattle yards. So really it's set to go um, as soon as settlement. Also has a, um, a large number of fences. And so everything is ready to go. There, there won't be any capital requirements to um, fix fences or to improve fences or um, add new fences, at least from um, 
initially, everything is is pretty much set to go. There's some more photos of uh, the landscape. In terms of carry capacity, it's running about um, 1,600 steers at the moment with the capacity to run 800 uh, cow and calf pairs, putting the dry shed equivalent at 16,000. Um, currently, the uh, owner is trading cattle, so he's buying in under underpriced cattle, fatting them up, and then uh, selling them uh, with mostly long periods between rotations. So he's just throwing them into uh, one paddock, letting them um, help themselves, and then moving them every so often. So we expect to be able to increase the carry capacity with holistic grazing. And so we'll get into this a bit later, but that's daily rotations. So really um, high stocking densities and really long rest periods. The price, the farm is 12 mil, which uh, is $5,700 per hectare. The main price per hectare for the Northern New South Wales area is 6,000. And that represents a uh, $15,000 uh, breeder uh, unit price. Even though we are talking about this property and uh, we're pretty keen on it, we're still on the uh, the lookout for other properties. So if you do know anyone that is uh, selling their farm, um, get them to send us a message because uh, we might be able to work something out off market. It is pretty good if you can work something out off market. You don't have to really pay a, a real estate agent. So you're saving a couple of percentage points there. Um, as I said, we do have other options, but it's, it's really good if we can find a, an even better farm uh, and get a better deal for everyone. What we are looking for, if anyone does have a farm, we're looking at anything from uh, 500 to 2,000 hectares or larger, anywhere from Wagga to Tamworth out to Dubbo. So uh, we're, we're looking at a quite a large area, mostly used for grazing cattle and sheep. Uh, and ready to start operations. So we we really want to make sure that the infrastructure is there so we can uh, start as soon as possible, but also reduce the capital requirements for the Bricklet owners. Through the Bricklet model, it's, it's pretty unique in the sense that we can offer Bricklets um, to the vendor um, to allow them to keep equity or, or ownership in the farm. So for example, you want to keep 20% ownership, but you want to sell 80%. So perhaps you're retiring and you want to sell some uh, equity, but you still want to be connected to the farm. This might be a really good option for you um, in, in that situation. And you can still be connected to the farm. You can still come out on, on uh, field days and, and workshops and still be a part of uh, this farm. So the... Regen Ag Park, which is really what we're uh, keen uh, to do on, on this particular, or on all farms, really. We, I'll start by asking everyone, if you want to throw in the chat, what do you see here? I might leave some time for that. What does everyone see here when we're looking at this picture? Yeah, dead grass, yep. Ground cover, yeah, that's good. Packed the soil. I oh, know. I we did take the shovel out. Um, oh, this is so. This is a photo that we took um, on Karajong Park when we were there. Um, we did put the shovel in the ground. Um, it don't. We didn't get too um, far uh, down to know if it was compacted or not. Yeah, opportunity. Yeah, that's good. Underutilized feed, awesome. Yeah, that you guys are pretty much spot on. So I see two things. I see um, over grazed pasture, which is you can kind of see the green coming up there, but also undergrazed pasture. So this is the really long pasture there, and it's too lignified, which means it's terrible feed. It's the digestibility of that feed is um, really low, and the cows that they're pretty much eating um, straw, so they're not going to get anything out of that. So what happens when we have overgrazed and undergrazed pastures is that our stocking density is too low. So we're not getting this uniform grazing pressure across the paddock. This allows the cattle to graze down the really palatable stuff. Think if, if you have all this food out in front of you, you're going to go for the best stuff first. You're not forced to eat everything. You're just going to pick the best stuff. And so what this is doing is that it's promoting unpalatable plants. And so over the long term, we're going to be reducing the quality of our pastures. 
It's also going to be reducing uh, regrowth on uh, the plants that we want to be promoting, and it reduces uh, pasture quality. So there's a massive opportunity uh, just with this property and, and what you saw just then to increase production just by correcting the grazing system. And so we can do that with uh, holistic management or regenerative grazing, and that's um, really high density grazing for short periods of time with really long recovery periods. And so what will happen, um, we'll graze down uh, all the grass and then allow that to, to regrow. We're also pretty keen to implement some silver pasture, which is basically using trees in a grazing system, and it allows the, the animals to graze the trees. Um, that adds a whole new range of, of possibilities when it comes to feed and, and the quality of feed and potentially even medicinal values when, when it comes to different type of trees, um, as well as providing cover and um, protection for the livestock. We're also keen to implement natural sequence farming contours to control the flow of uh, the water and rehydrate the land. Uh, and key line principles, uh, I'm pretty keen to use um, some of the principles from um, Pat Colby and um, Jerry Renetti. So they're very much focusing on uh, animal nutrition and managing animal um, mineral intake. They do a lot in terms of uh, the mineral buffets. And so you put out, out a bunch of um, minerals for the, for the animals to self-feed on. And so they'll, they'll take what they need, um, the idea being that they, they understand and know what they need. And the best part about this is that you you gain two things. You gain um, the animals are now sufficient in, in their mineral needs, but what they don't need and that what they don't need when they eat those minerals gets passed through and then fertilizes our paddocks. And so we don't need to be driving, I guess, the tractor over to fertilize the paddocks. Or in this particular case, the owner has been flying over and, and um, uh, throwing out uh, super. We don't need to be spending all that money on. Um, plane and, and labour and um, diesel or, or whatever uh, to get our paddocks fertilised. We just supply the animals, uh, the minerals they need, um, and then they're going to fertilise it for us. Uh, we're going to be increasing biodiversity, so using uh, increasing uh, the pasture, the trees, wildlife, uh, maybe even livestock, so going into um, sheep, uh, potentially even chickens and uh, pigs. We want to be limiting chemical use, even though I said that we're going to be um, allowing the cattle to um, self-select different minerals. Um, we don't really want to be using too much pesticides and herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, uh, and, and really harsh inorganic fertilizers. We, and, and the reason behind that is we want to be promoting pretty much life and um, the biodiversity and the, the microbes. And so when we're applying all these sides, um, I'm pretty sure side means kill. Um, so if you're trying to make something live, but you're applying all these killing things, I mean, there's a, um, it's a bit antagonistic to, to your goals. We want to be implementing proper pasture management, no-till. Um, perhaps we might use um, some yeoman, like the yeoman's plough, um, try that out, um, but mostly no-till and potentially even pasture cropping. And so this is really a whole range of different regen ag techniques. But the most important one that we want to focus is having a really good company culture. And so when we get to um, employing a farm manager, we want to make sure that they want to be a part of our vision and want to be a part of uh, improving meta farms and, and the bigger vision for that. This is, um, I think it's ground Groundwell's uh, principles for region ag. So you can see there diversity, livestock integration, mineral soil disturbance, and maintaining living roots, soil protection. So all of these, we need all of these um, to come together so that we can build soil fertility. And as a result, we're going to be growing more pasture. And as a result of growing more pasture, we're going to be raising more animals. And so that's good for you guys um, because it will increase or should increase the value of the farm. Now, there's a whole range of different ideas when it comes to principles of regen ag, but you should be able to pick out what's common across all of them. So we've got these ones. We also have the natural sequence farming principles. So that's slow the flow, let all plants grow, uh, careful where the animals grow, infiltration is a must know, and return um, fertility to the top. Um, they will rhyme. There's also um, the six principles of soil health from uh, green cover seed, 
There's um, uh, John Kempf's pl uh, Plant Health Period Pyramid. I would highly recommend um, checking out John Kempf and his work. It's fantastic. And then there's RCS um, principles for regenerative grazing. So we'll be implementing pretty much all of this, making sure that this is truly a case study for uh, regen ag. And I strongly believe if you want to be growing pasture or growing living things, you got to be allowing these living things to grow. And the best way to do that is by making living soil. And so that involves all, all um, the microbes and growing, and, um, growing plant roots and having a, a really functional living uh, agro ecosystem to support that. So this is a grass, uh, grass growth um, uh, graph pretty much. And, and you'll see that it's a S curve. So it starts pretty slow here. The rate of growth is pretty um, low and then it rapidly increases and then plateaus at the top. And so uh, what we want to be doing in every grazing uh, enterprise is we want to allow for the grass to grow up to almost this maximum yield point. And then we want to graze down to a point where we're not damaging the, uh, the roots. We're not preventing the roots from, um, from growing um, while uh, still yeah, allowing these, these plants to have enough st uh, stores, storage of um, energy to allow them to regrow. And so we want to be grazing between the lines. So um, put the cows in when it reaches, uh, I guess it's max or just before it's max yield potential, and then grazing down to the end or to the start of the um, second phase, growth phase. And so allowing that, we're going to be keeping a lot of energy in the roots, which will allow for the plants to regrow faster. And we'll also be capturing a lot more of that um, growth curve. And when we have that, we're going to be growing pretty much more grass more often um, rather than stunting the growth of our uh, grasses. And then it's going to take a long time for, for that to grow back. So you can see here on the left-hand side, um, the percentage of leaf volume removed. So once we get past 50%, the um, roots pretty much stop growing by um, uh, 50%. So that's, that's a large amount um, of reduction, even, even between 50 and 60%, you know, we're uh, going from zero to 50% reduction in root growth. So it's so important to know when to pull out the livestock and how much um, leaf matter we, we remove because we don't want to be inhibiting our plants from growing. The photo on the right-hand side is, the RC, uh, is from RCS, and that just shows a, a continuous grazing system versus a um, regenerative grazing system versus pretty much no grazing. And so there are different uh, phases. So we have phase one, um, phase two, and phase three. So if we go back to, to here, the left-hand side is phase one, the middle is phase two, and on the right-hand side is phase three. And so phase three is um, poor quality. It's too lignified. Um, the uh, phase one, there's not enough volume there. It's not going to regrow properly. Um, and the roots are going to be used for energy to then increase the plant growth. And we, and we don't want that. We want the plants to be maximizing their photosynthetic potential to then supply all its um, energy needs back down to the roots to allow those roots to grow. Um, you can see there that um, plant is getting 120 days of rests. Uh, we'll be somewhere around that, um, 120 to um, 180, but also it depends on the growth rate of um, the pastures. How can we do this? How can we make sure that we're getting a uniform grazing um, across all our pastures? Pretty much what we want to do is we want to make really small paddocks and increase the stock and densities so that the livestock are forced a everything in front of them. And so we can do that just by dividing up our paddocks into um, small lots. And we want to be making sure that our stocking densities is equal to our carry capacity. And so we can, we can do this um, even on, on Karajong Park without putting in additional uh, permanent fences, just by using an electric fence and an energizer. So then we can make that up uh, any particular way we want. We can change it from year to year and make sure that um, it's not just the same thing every time. So it's it's uh, it's not a hard setup to, to implement, and we can just have that around uh, the dams. Cool. So that's an example that that I just 
thought up of uh, quickly. Now, I mean, when we start or, or five years in, this will probably be very different. But as a probably a place to start, I'd um, divide um, the um, size of the property by 180, so half a year. So we're expecting the pasture to be grazed twice a year. That means that we need um, uh, 11.4 hectares a day. Divide that up um, in one of the paddocks, so say point. Um, that's going to allow us to graze that paddock for uh, 5.6 days, say just five days, we'll divide that paddock paddock up into five smaller paddocks. Now, of course, when we actually do this, it probably won't be like that. And so um, for the first year, we'll make sure that the the farm manager is keeping a really close eye on on the the height of the pasture and making sure that we're not going past 50%. Um, height. So as I said, this is really dynamic and it will change depending on uh, the climate or the time of year, the land. So some of the land, as we said before, it changes from trap soils to um, uh, basalt soils, changes in topography, everything changes. So this is very dynamic and we need to be making sure that it matches to what the land needs. Some people are, are, are really fixated on, you know, I need, to, I need to move my cattle every day or every second day or once a week where the land isn't, you know, it's not fixed, it's dynamic, it's moving. So we need to make sure that our management practices reflect the needs of the land rather than a calendar. Um, so we can we can really easily do that just with uh, electric fencing. Um, it's not it's not too expensive to, to set up. It's pretty easy um, and there's not a large capital requirement. A really good case study for this kind of uh, grazing and uh, management is uh, this farm, and you can find that on Soils for Life. It's it's um, 22 k's from Urala, which is uh, I'm pretty sure it's it's one of the neighbours of Caradong Park. I'm not too sure exactly where it is, but that would be very close. So I'll definitely recommend going to check that out, uh, having a look at what they've been able to do on their farm, and just think about what will we we would be able to do on Caradong Park. And so the link that is there if you're interested. Soils for Life is fantastic for um, case studies of region ag. Um, just go go explore it. Um, a lot of people were asking about drought resistance on the farm, and in my mind, there's so there's two sections we can we can um, split this up into to, to tackle. So first, there's our farming operations, how we actually run our farm. And the second one is our business operations, how we run our businesses and finances, which is um, very important when it comes to drought resistance. So the first one is our farming operations. We want to make sure we're increasing stock and humus, as well as our infiltration, water holding capacity rates, and we want to be reducing evaporation. All of this comes from an increase in uh, humus. Um, really, we want to be capturing as much rainfall as we can. So we want to increase our infiltration rate, but also want to be holding that uh, water um, as much as possible because we can have a really high infiltration rate, but a really low holding uh, water holding capacity. We're just going to get um, underwater um, seepage from that. Um, so we want to make sure we have a large water holding capacity, which we can get from increasing our soil organic carbon. Um, that. Increasing soil organic carbon also reduces evaporation from a uh, insulation property that it has. It's uh, really amazing. Quick plug: um, I just released a soil organic carbon uh, course on the soil uh, soil learning center. So if you are interested in learning more about soil organic carbon and how that can in, in, um, affect your farm and, and lead to drought resistance, um, I highly recommend checking that out. Otherwise, we can also use uh, some natural sequence farming techniques. So slowing the flow, this allows us to really capture all the water and control exactly where it's going. We don't want all this runoff because once once it goes into the waterways, it's pretty much gone. We want to make sure that we can hydrate the water, uh, hydrate the landscape by uh, distributing the water across uh, the landscape evenly and slowing it down so it has time to infiltrate. We also want to make sure we always have at least 90 days worth of uh, feed and offer or food. Um, uh, having uh, trading cattle allows us to very easily get rid of cattle. We're not emotionally attached to our trading stock. You just get rid of them uh, when you have to. It's not like um, a high value um, 
uh, breeding stock, which you might it might pay off to um, feed them uh, supplementary. Uh, we always want to make sure we have 90 days worth of feed. And so when we do hit a drought or say the um, we get less rain and so less pasture growth, we can get rid of cattle so that we always have 90, 90 days worth of feed. Uh, I'm pretty keen to implement some remote sensing technology to estimate uh, foo. So you can get satellite imaging, which estimates um, foo, and then we can just uh, graze according to those and, and, and have those to help us make um, different decisions on the farm. So, for example, if there's, if there's a paddock with a lot more um, feed, we can go to that first um, and then move around the farm accordingly. We'll make sure uh, we're grazing holistically, so we're not over or under gra grazing. We'll make sure that we're not um, damaging our plants um, and stunting their growth. And there's a really good opportunity to uh, restore the local short water cycle. Um, that is essentially making sure that we're keeping a cool surface temperature or cooler, uh, which will allow for, um, I think it's the, uh, the water to come back to the surface in the early mornings and that's going to hydrate um the landscape with um pretty much dew and so we can do that by planting a lot more trees i think the estimate was um 50 trees a hectare if you can increase it or put 50 trees a hectare you're doing a really good job in contributing to fixing the short water cycle i'm not exactly sure how much um, of an improvement that will make some estimates say that 40 percent of our rain comes from uh transpiration so if we can increase that, um, potentially there's a big opportunity to improve our drought resistance by fixing this cycle. But of course, if, if we're getting only um, 200 mils of rain, there's um, there might you know we're still going to be in, in a drought. So in terms of the business operations, in in my mind, I want to make sure that I'll have enough uh, money in the bank to be able to fund all farming operations for say 18 to, to two years if there's a drought. So I wanna know how often um, will I make less than zero dollars profit? And so we can do this with uh, one um, assumption that is production is proportional to rainfall. So for example, in an average year, uh, which is, so we're basing this off the current farming operations. Uh, we talked to the vendor and this is what he said, um, of 1,600 steers producing 0.7 kilos a day at a price of $5 a kilo live weight, which is about $2 million uh, a year. So the average rainfall is 791 mils. That means across um, the farming operation, we're going to be making uh, $250 um, a year for every mill we get. So um, now I know there's probably problems with this with with this model and it's probably not linear. Um, but just as a thought exercise, um, this is really valuable. So with that, we can go into um, the, the bomb and look at the last, um, I think it's oh, 119 years of uh, rainfall data. If we take the lowest rainfall across that time, which is one year out of 119 years, we take the um, the, the lowest 10 percent, which is um, uh, all these numbers here. So we're looking at uh, this number, this number, this number, uh, these two numbers. This gives us the ability to um, graph the chance of rainfall. And so when we do graph that, it looks a bit like that. So this gives us the probability um, of, uh, I guess, rainfall for that year. So for example, 60% 60, 60 of the time, we're gonna get uh, uh, rainfall before that. So 60% of the time, uh, rainfall is going to land somewhere in here. And so what we can do with this, now that we've got a chance of rainfall, we can, make a chance of profit with that number that we worked out before. So if we got an income per mil of rain and then we uh, then we get our, um, our, our rainfall over our chance of getting that rainfall, we can then work out um, based on our rainfall where our profits are going to be for that year. And so when we graph that, we're going to get something like this. So there's about a three, four 
chance of probability each year that we're going to make less than zero dollars profit. Um, as you can see here, where this line hits uh, zero, that's where we're going to be making zero dollars. And then after that, it will cost us um, to maintain operations at that um, at that current operation. So with this, let's say there's a 5% chance that we're going to make less than uh, zero dollars, which means one year in every 20 years, we're going to make less than zero dollars profit. So let's make a decision from that data into how we can manage our farm. So let's say um, uh, during uh, these years, we also have zero income. So just to make it hard, even harder. Therefore, we have to pay all of our expenses um, once every 20 years. So there's just an estimate of, of some of the, our, um, our costs for running that particular farm. So it works out to be just shy of a million dollars. Um, so how much do we have to save each year to allow us to pretty much meet that expenditure once every 20 years? And so we just divide that by 19 because we have 19 years to uh, save. And then on our 20th year, um, that's pretty much when we have to, um, uh, that's when we have to pretty much pay for our, our drought year. Um, so it means each year we'd have to be pretty much putting away $50,000 in order to make a insurance um, kind of policy for us. Realistically, I'd prefer to put away 100% of our profits until we have a safety barrier um, for a drought, um, which will allow for 18 months worth of costs. And that, that's assuming that uh, once our, a drought year hits, we then um, don't have any production. Uh, and then with that money, we would then put that into a range of low risk investment just to make sure we're not losing purchasing power. So that includes a um, one of those drought um, uh, bank account funds, which are untaxed. Um, don't don't quote me on this; it's not financial advice, but I'm pretty sure it's um, a quarter of a mil. Which is uh, you put that money into one of these bank accounts; it's untaxed until you pull it, pull it out, and then I'm pretty sure that just goes onto your um, uh, income for that year. So we would want at least three months worth of uh, costs in that, as well as uh, term deposits, so a range of maturities from six to 12 months, and then potentially even a little bit in broad-based index funds. And so this allows us to not only have the money uh, in case we need to pay um, uh, our costs during a drought, but also, I guess, putting that money away in different investments so that we're not losing purchasing power. So it's not dead money, um, it's kind of just stored money. Um, cost will, uh, now, uh, considering this, costs will most likely uh, reduce uh, during this time as operations decrease. Um, it is better to sell off uh, cattle as food decreases than it is to buy in hay. So we, we don't really want to be increasing our cost by buying in lots of hay. That's way too complicated and it's going to add so much more costs to our operation. It's better just to, to sell off cattle. And I know that during these times, prices are probably going to um, reduce, but it's better to um, sell off your cattle or have a game plan to sell off your cattle than to destroy your pastures. Um, and it might be a good option to stock up on hay during good times um, if, you're, if you're able to store that uh, and then feed that to breeders in a specific paddock. So you, you can have a kind of a sacrifice paddock that you're happy for it to get destroyed. Um, and, and feed them there to protect the rest of your uh, paddocks. But otherwise, um, I mean, it really depends on the price um, of hay and, and what's the cost benefit of that. Now, with that model, it, it probably won't actually happen like that. I'd be the first to recognise that this that model is going to be nothing like the real world. Um, but it's, I think it's still important to consider this process of planning the finances in case of a drought and putting away money um, in case it happens. And this is essentially what uh, insurance companies do. They, they take your probability and, and the risk of that and then charge you um, accordingly for that. As they say, it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. So some of the assumptions that I've made in uh, this model is that income is linear to rainfall and most likely it, it won't be. It'll probably be a little bit more like a S-curve. So on the extremes, it flattens out. 
Cattle prices are constant, so that's an assumption I made. is far from the, uh, the truth. Um, and it uh, probably will decrease during droughts. Costs are fixed. Most likely they'll decrease if we're not buying in hay or increasing uh, supplementary feeds. No additive rainfall from short water cycles from the farm. Uh, another su- assumption is that there's no uh, government funding grants or help. And there's also an assumption that we won't have any additional income or uh, income streams. And uh, a really important assumption is that drought years are independent. Now, in reality, there actually might be, um, say, back-to-back uh, droughts, which uh, there's a higher probability of those happening than, um, I guess, independent droughts, So, if that makes sense. So the model assumes that there's an equal chance each year that a drought is going to happen, which is 5%. However, in terms of looking at um, uh, cycles in in climate, we might have a period of lower rainfall, which might be five years, for example. And so there's a high percentage of drought within those five years. So the bricklet details. So the bricklet um, will cost... Um, the cost of the bricklet will be made up of the property costs, so that's 12 mil, as well as stamp duty. So stamp duty uh, will be 646,300, uh, as well as the bricklet fees, so to get a uh, bricklet to fractionalise all the uh, bricklets um, and then run it through their uh, system, as well as initial working capital, so 12 months worth of operations and um, some cattle to stock uh, the property. And so that will bring a total raise of 14.7 mil uh, for the bricklets. Now there's a thousand bricklets on off, uh, sorry, there's a thousand um, bricklets total. Sorry, there's a spelling mistake there. Uh, and there's 950 bricklets on offer. Each is um, 15.5 thousand each. For the lease, it's 3% of the total bricklet raise. So, which is uh, 14.75. And that works out to be about um, $435 um, per bricklet per year. Now, if you do the math, that's a bit less than um, 3% of um, the total raise. And that's because uh, bricklet has um, a couple of fees. And then I think I just rounded it down to a, to a neater number. So, if you're deciding to buy a bricklet, this is essentially what, what you're going to get for owning a bricklet. So the lease is $435 uh, a year per bricklet. That works out to be, I think, 2.8% uh, uh, net. The appreciation on the property, which is 9.4% for the Armadale region, now that's taken from the uh, Rural Bank's farming value report uh, for this year. I'd highly recommend uh, reading through that. Um, so it's important to understand that that 9.4% is, is applied to the property and not the total uh, bricklet amount. So it's the 12 mil, which is um, appreciating, which works out to be uh, 1,100 per bricklet. And so when we add that together, the at least in the first year, the expected return is around 1,500, which works out to be 10%. Now, when you compare that to a lot of other asset classes, that is a pretty good return. I think the ASX uh, 200 averages around 8 to 10%, but also you get all that volatility. Like we see the stock market on the news every night, and it's it's like that. Farmland um, is less so. Uh, it's less so volatile. It's less so correlated to um, uh, the stock market or even, even uh, the residential market. It's less correlated. There, now, there's um, a really big opportunity for forced appreciation from uh, us regenerating the farm. I don't know exactly how much, and we should just consu- uh, assume this is a uh, added benefit that we get. So we should just be happy with the 10%, um, and anything above that is just a massive benefit. And it's a it's a way to, I guess, ethically invest your money. Um, so we're improving the ecosystem and, and um, the agro-ecosystem of the farm will bring back biodiversity and wildlife and, and all of that. So when we consider uh, evaluating a farm, uh, or at least this particular farm, we're looking at the uh, production of the farm, so the production factor, multiplied by 
the I guess the multiplier factor. So if you if anyone um, is familiar with shares, this is almost like um, a DCF model. So it's um, the um, earnings for the for the company multiplied by a PE ratio, and that's going to give you your price per uh, share. In this case, the whole farm is valued at the production of that farm, so 800, uh, 800 breeder units, multiplied what you're willing to pay for a breeder unit. And in this case, they're valuing, uh, valuing the breeder value at 15,000. And so that gives the total um, valuation at 12 mil. Now, this is where um, Regent Ag is really amazing. And it wasn't until I had a look at um, this that I was like, wow, this is a massive opportunity for us. Um, yeah, so there, there we have it. The price is determined by the production factor multiplied by the multiplier factor. So what happens if we increase our carry capacity to a 1,000 breeder units? So we have now, so we um, can uh, holistically graze and improve the fertility of our um, soil and, and then we can increase pasture. We just utilise the, the pasture that's there and we end up, we're able to produce a thousand breeder units, well, then our evaluation on the farm now becomes 15 mil, which is a, which is a additional 9.2%. What if we increase the soil organic carbon so that our farm is more uh, drought resistant? As we're increasing the water holding capacity and we're increasing the infiltration, um, would you pay more for a farm that's more drought resistant? For example, you go into drought later and you come out sooner. How much would you pay for that? Perhaps you'd pay $18,000 per breeder unit versus $15,000. So you're paying a, a premium for this additional value. And so in that, in that case, it's an additional 20%. Um, on top of that 9.2% that we gained from increasing our carry capacity. And so you can see here, there's a massive opportunity to um, increase the value of a farm by uh, increasing the production through regen ag. Um, so we can see here we're getting about 10-ish from background returns, which are uh, the lands appreciation. So for, for the Armadale region, that's about 9.2% plus the lease. Um, and there's a massive opportunity to make a, a, a healthy return from regenerative, regenerative returns, which is made up of the um, forced appreciation plus an increase in the lease. As the lease will increase as production increases and, and every time the lease renews, that will increase. And so um, it's, it's very fair to uh, increase the lease if you're, if you're making more. And that's, um, I guess that's fair. There's a whole nother side that we're able to um, implement for the Bricklet um, model that you probably wouldn't be able to find anywhere else, and that's the farm and lifestyle benefits. And so we're able to implement a community-supported uh, agricultural model into this and allow our, all our Bricklet holders the first access to premium regenerative, uh, regeneratively grazed beef. Now, it'll probably be Angus, um, and it will be at a, a wholesale price. So not only are you, are you getting really good returns, but you're getting first access at a wholesale price for some really good beef. And that will, and um, as we increase the uh, mineral content of our pastures, that will probably flow onto uh, the cattle. And so we're getting really high um, mineral dense food. On top of that, uh, we're keen to have everyone come to the farm on two days. Uh, in courses and workshops and conferences and, and all of that, which you wouldn't be able to find, um, I don't think, in, in many other uh, uh, opportunities. We're pretty keen to build a physical soil learning centre um, on the farm so that people can come in, they can use telescopes and um, a microscope, sorry, um, to look at uh, the soil um, right in front of them and, and we can show uh, them that. Um, it, this is also a great way to ethically invest or ethically put your money to work as we're going to be supporting these ecosystems um, and bringing back biodiversity and all this uh, fantastic stuff, which is which is really good for uh, the environment and, and uh, for all of us. We'll also be um, planting a lot of trees uh, on this property too. 
And plus, you can say you own a regenerative farm uh, or a massive regenerative farm in uh, Armidale or near Armidale. And so that's uh, a bit of bragging rights, I guess, there too. So for the for, for the Brickler owners, there's um, no additional capital requirements. So the fifteen and a half thousand dollars upfront, and and that's it. There's there's no additional uh, raises, and we're actually um, with the Bricklet model, we're not allowed to do that. So you're not buying into a business uh, or a company. It's purely buying farmland, and then that's leased out to someone. In this particular case, it's it's us. So in the initial raise, Meta Farms is requesting funds for working capital and initial cap, uh, cattle purchases. Uh, that will be taken out as almost like a fee, um, such as uh, Bricklet's fee, and that will um, just get us started with operating the farm um, and getting the cattle. And so we'll pay that 3%. Uh, we'll pay returns on that with the 3%. Um, we are not offering a ultra high risk, high, ultra high return opportunity. This is this is not a get rich quick scheme. Don't think it is. Don't, don't think you're going to be a, a billionaire through this. We're simply, this is just a opportunity to protect your money from, um, I guess, inflation and uh, the eroding powers of inflation. Um, if you're looking for an opportunity to farm the land yourself, this is this is not for you. This is not a community garden. It's not a community run farm. Um, the bricklet owner is essentially uh, passive. They don't have to do anything apart from collect their um, their lease payment. Um, and even that, it just gets sent straight into your bank account. So all you have to do is spend it. Um, in terms of all the work that's on Meta Farms to firstly operate the farm and to make sure all the payments of the lease is is dealt with. with. So, essentially, we're taking the the role of uh, a real estate agent. If you, um, for example, if you have a investment uh, property in, in residential real estate, usually uh, people get the uh, real estate agent to find all the the um, renters and do all that kind of stuff. So, we're taking on that role too. We're also not offering the ability for everyone to come onto the farm freely. It's a it's a fully operational farm, and in any other situation, if you if you're leasing out um, property, you you lose the right to have free ac free access to that property. We want to have you guys on the farm. We want to be able to show you your farm and and how we are being good stewards of your farm. And so we're going to be having. Uh, field days and, and farm events uh, quarterly, even potentially more if, if everyone's interested in that. But you can't just rock up and go for a walk. And, and there's massive risks like biosecurity risks and, and it's just a headache. So we're not offering that. Uh, it's not a um, come farm um, yourself. It's, it's, it's not that. And it's also not a, a get rich uh, scheme. This is slow, farmland slow, grass grows really slowly. Um, it's it's uh yeah it's not a get rich quick scheme. So in essence, for the bricklet holders, you get good returns, so ten ish percent, good risk adjusted returns, regenerative returns. You're making a positive impact, so you can be using your money to really be rebuilding um, ecosystems. A lot of people just give money to say, um, uh, what, um, uh, I can't remember, but uh, charities which do positive work. In this situation, you can put your money to work and make yourself a return while um, having these positives, uh, positive impacts. And that's really the, uh, the real beauty of Regen Ag. And also, it doesn't cost us uh, much additional um, capital to make these improvements. All we're doing is rotating our cattle in a timely manner and making sure that we're um, really focusing on uh, plant growth and, and being in tune with nature. And so it's not like we're applying hundreds of thousands of dollars on humic substances to, to apply over the farm. Really, we're just making sure that the cattle uh, are grazing properly. And so it's not it's not a massive uh, capital requirement for you guys to increase the um, fertility of the farm. Um, I mean, the, the contour uh, banks meta farm will just pay for. Um, I mean. I bet we're going to be the best um, renters you'll ever you'll ever see. Um, 
fencing too, like that, that will all be for, uh, that will all be under uh, Meta Farms. Uh, it'll be a Meta Farm problem. Another big benefit of, I guess, having Meta Farms as um, the leasee is that we're, we're thinking of this project for 20, 30 years' time. We're, we're thinking of um, pretty much expanding Meta Farms and Carradong Park or our first farm will be a key um, property in that. And so we're really thinking long term. Um, I'm quite eager to say that I'm I'm willing to take this on as my life's work and, and to improve farms across Australia and maybe the world. Um, and it all starts, I guess, with um, this first farm. And so we're we're eager to be long-term um, leasees, which means there's basically not going to be any vacancy rates. And so a, a big problem with uh, commercial real estate and farmland is that there's there can often be a really long period of time between um, uh, leases, like a year or two years. And for this particular farm, it's it's a quite a big farm. And so um, if you lose a, a, a lease, it might take a long time to get um, someone back in. And in that time, you're losing returns. You'll also be getting uh, farm and lifestyle returns, which you probably wouldn't be able to find uh, anywhere else. And there's an in- improved liquidity through the Bricklets um, marketplace. And so that actually overcomes a lot of the problem with farmland in the sense that it is a very illiquid uh, asset class. Something that's really good with this model is that we no, we're not using any debt. Um, and so there's no risk in terms of um, the uh, you guys, I guess, going to travel in terms of debt. Um, Meta Farms itself um, won't be using any debt to buy cattle um, or operations. Um, we, we would rather bring on a outside investor separate to Bricklet to own um, ownership in Meta Farms to give working capital than to take out massive uh, amounts of debt. And currently at the moment with interest rates increasing, um, I see that taking out massive amounts of debt can be very problematic. So maybe if that doesn't sound good to you, if this doesn't sound good to you, perhaps Metafarm is not for you. And, and that's fine. It's It won't be for everyone. Um, there's a lot of other um, opportunities to uh, invest in ag-related um, businesses and um, uh, trusts. So the first one is Pack Horse Partial. So they operate through a trust structure, uh, which is different to what we're doing. They are reg- region ag, so it's, it is uh, also ethical investing. They have target returns of about 8 to 10%. So we're probably up on, I guess, the higher side of that. Uh, a negative is you can't see the farm, or at least to my knowledge, um, you can't see your land. And they're also only for sophisticated investors. So unless you have a net worth of two mil or you make a quarter of a mil in uh, income, then you won't be considered a sophisticated uh, investor. And so you're not allowed to invest with them. There's also Rural Funds Group, which is uh, on the ASX. Now, for a disclosure, I own shares in Rural Funds Group and they operate through a trust. They're not region ag. You can't see the land. Um, but you're able to access them. I, I'm, a, you know, I have shares in them. They're very easy to buy and sell. Um, so there's there's that too, if if you want that. And there's also a bunch of other ASX listed uh, ag companies. Um, some where they um, they buy land and then operate it themselves. Others uh, lease land. Um, these can. I guess be considered a little bit more risky as you're buying businesses rather than uh, the farmland itself, and therefore you're exposed to all these businesses, uh, business risks. With meta farms, you're not exposed to. Um, I guess our, if we go into a drought, you're not affected. We'll still be paying that lease, and as you as you saw before, um, we are very keen to have a large uh, pool of cash to make sure that pretty much you guys get looked after first. Um, it'd be my worst nightmare for um, to miss a, a lease repayment pretty much. Um, so you're not exposed to uh, the, the business um, uh, risks. And the last option, I guess, if you want to um, get involved in farmland is you can do it yourself and buy and operate your own farm. 
Now, this is uh, quite hard, as we talked about in our last webinar. Um, you need a large amount of money for that. You might need to take out a lot of debt. You also need the knowledge to operate a farm um, as well as to buy a farm. You need lots of time, lots of money. And now you also have to fix fences and deal with all that extra stuff. But if if that's you and, and that's certainly me, then you might as well go um, operate your own farm rather than uh, joining Meta Farms. So um, if, if this does resonate with you and you are looking for uh, a place to park your cash uh, while investing in or, or buying something that is ethical um, and you're using your money for good while getting a good return and um, it's on the lesser risky side, then this might be an option for you. But it, it might not be and um, that's completely okay. So that was all for um, you guys, or, uh, the Bricklet um, owners, or potentially you guys. For Meta Farms, uh, we will be leasing the farm at a 3% um, of the initial Bricklet raise. This will be a triple net lease, meaning that we pay everything. There's, there's nothing that you guys pay, nothing that you have to worry about. It's essentially passive. We pay for all the insurance, uh, council rates, um, everything. Um, we won't we won't pay uh, taxes on the money, so it won't be. Um, uh, well, I guess it wouldn't be able to be uh, a franked kind of dividend because it's not um, a business. It's almost as if you're getting uh, additional, say, four hundred and thirty five dollars in income. So I'm not a tax professional. Go speak to a professional um, uh, financial advisor, but um, essentially it won't be a fully franked dividend. Uh, we will be taking a five uh, five percent of the bricklets as a management fee. This is better, or I feel this is better than a, a percentage fee um, each year. So some companies like Acre Trader um, they take a point seven five percent each year um, of the investment value, and that's taken out of the lease. I think this is much better because it, it incentivizes us to uh, align with the bricklet owners. Um, and if you don't want to take my word for it, um, there's, I guess, this uh, additional um, uh, structure to allow for that. And I guess you could also think about this as a premium for us to be regenerating your farm um, and providing fill days and managing the bricklets. So I don't, I don't think a 5% of the bricklets is a, um, a poor deal. Um, I think that's quite fair. We will also be operating a carbon credit program on top of the farm, um, because the um, because of the rules around uh, the bricklet model doesn't allow for I guess distributions. Um, that will be um, I guess held by Meta Farms. So um, a couple of people asked about the team and who's managing this project. So um, I'm Teal. I'm one of the directors at Meta Farms. I'm a fifth generation farmer in Hawkesbury. So we uh, have free range pigs and they're all pasture raised. We also have cattle and villa calves and a small, a small amount of sheep, uh, not for um, uh, commercial, uh, I guess, not on commercial size, just a couple for us. I'm currently studying ag science at the University of Sydney. I'm also the founder of Agrisol, which is a uh, regenerative ag consultancy. Uh, I've also ha I also have a, a YouTube channel called Agriculture Explained by Agrisol, um, and I've done John Kemp's course, which is really good. I'd, I'd highly recommend it for um, anyone interested in learning a lot more about the science. It's a very, um, I guess, uh, heavy course in terms of the science technology, uh, uh, science words and um, and ideas. You kind of have to have a basic knowledge be before accessing a lot of um, his content. Um, and that, that's on the Region Ag Academy. I've also done a number of courses on uh, Ray's um, platform, the Soil Learning Centre. Uh, one in particular from Jerry Bonetti. He does a fantastic job on explaining animal nutrition um, and number and number of books. I uh, love reading about um, Region Ag and farming operations. I'm, I'm very passionate about this. Um, as you can see, they're passionate about Region Ag. Um, Ray, do you want to talk about yourself for a bit? I think I think I've talked talked um, a fair bit over an hour, mate. Over an hour, you're done. Yeah. Wow, what a machine! Thank you so much. Yeah, so most people in the room probably know who I am, and if you don't, um, Regen Ray, 
um, soil health advocator and um, educator, um, many years ago got addicted to learning about soil. Um, the deep, deep, deeper I dug, the more I wanted to unlearn uh, to, to learn about it. And so, um, Farming Secrets and the Soil Learning Centre are the platforms that I'm hanging out with and and partnered with Helen and Hugo um, to take that business into the next generation. Um, launched a podcast all about soil, giving our soils a voice, and that's called Secrets of the Soil. Hung out with a lot of different mentors, experts, and um, thought leaders over the many years. Um, I've trained and done the holistic um, management grazing course, um, and also currently undertaking a permaculture course um, with um, um, David Holgram, and that's quite good. That's the first time they're doing it online after two years of cancelling it because of COVID. So um, that's quite interesting dynamic to do it via Zoom calls and uh, virtual tours of, of um, the, the, the land. Um, yeah, so my background is startup, business, tech, marketing, and and um, yeah, I guess that's where kind of a lot of the knowledge and Venn diagram of what Teal brings to the party and like what I bring to the party um, kind of overlaps in is our passion for Regen Ag. And uh, for those who don't know, Teal and I met on a Zoom call during COVID. Um, he rocked up with his uh, YouTube channel in the background and I went and watched it and was like, wow, this, look at all the stuff that this 19-year-old fifth-generation farmer is doing. And I was like... Could, you know, we we hook, you know, kind of met up and um, haven't stopped talking since. Uh, there's a podcast interview with Teal uh, as well. So you probably noticed tonight that Teal hasn't left any stone unturned. Um, so it really goes into the numbers and has a great mind to uh, unpack and really, um, you know, do the due diligence. This property that we're talking about tonight is one of many that we've calculated numbers on or Teal's calculated most of the numbers on and even gone and seen. So uh, lots of kilometres driving around and walking the land to make sure that, you know, we're getting the right ones. So thanks, Till. Back to you. Hopefully that was enough rest for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's awesome. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. Um, we will also be looking at expanding the team to uh, in the future. So we're looking at bringing on a farm manager uh, to manage the farm, so uh, to manage the day-to-day -day operations so that uh, Ray and I can take a bit more of a um, uh, a visionary role and, and really expand uh, the vision we have for MetaFarms. Uh, we're looking for someone with a background uh, and understanding of holistic management or um, regenerative grazing. We want them to have experience with large scale uh, cattle operations. We don't want a moron farmer. So moron mean like put more on. Um, like there's, a, there's a fantastic book um, about that. We also want them to be passionate about regen egg. Uh, we also will will be bringing on a uh, a marketing manager and, and um, a content creator into the future. So we want someone to blow us up on TikTok, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. It really uh, show um, everyone Meta Farms and and the work we're doing uh, there. Um, we want someone who understands all these different platforms, how they operate, the algorithms on that, and how um, to maximize organic reach. If you know who Gary V is um, and understand what he's saying, uh, then you know you will know exactly what we're looking for. And we also want them to be passionate about Regen Ag. So what's next? So if you if you're pretty keen on uh, continuing and and uh, joining us on this journey, the next stage is to commit to a bricklet. And so this involves um, setting up a bricklet account and transferring uh, one thousand dollars into that. Uh, account that is 100% refundable until uh, the confirmation date in which um, you'll actually buy the bricklet. And in that case, if uh, the price is still uh, fifteen and a half thousand dollars bricklet, then you need to make up the additional uh, fourteen point five uh, thousand to purchase the bricklet. So um, there's um, pretty much three steps left. Uh, you've got to sign up to bricklet, and then um, uh, get your account verified. It may, it may take 24 hours to verify. Um, then you can uh, complete the request to buy form uh, and then fund your account with $1,000. So you can get, uh, you can do, uh, find all those steps on our website at uh, metafarm.com forward slash get slash um, uh, started. Uh, there will also be an option on the farm to book a one-on-one uh, one -on -one meeting with us if you have any questions, ask us personally, or if you need help getting started, um, or if you have any other um, big questions. I know we've got uh, a heap of questions now, and, and we also um, 
answered a lot of questions from our other webinar, which is also on the website under Q&A. Um, but there's, a, there's an option uh, to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting uh, with us. Cool. So um, that is it for, um, I guess, my slides. Um, so tonight, I might stop sharing. Awesome. So we've got a lot of um, questions from the chat. I've been curating the ones I haven't answered. So if I didn't answer you live, um, then I've been putting them uh, uh, in a little notepad um, and we'll cover them off now. Um, so, Teal, um, I've just sent them to your messenger so you can see what I'm seeing if you want to oh, follow yeah. along. Um, cool. So one of the first questions um, that came up, um, is it possible to reinvest the lease payments back into the farm? And um, I thought that was a good question in, in, in regards to, you know, some shares where you the dividend gets kind of compounded into it. Um, my, th my thoughts on that is the money gets distributed through uh, the Bricklet model. So that will sit in your Bricklet account. If a Bricklet came back on the market, someone wanted to sell that, you would then be one of the first to know about that. Our community will always know when Bricklets come up for sale. That's the whole point of having the Bricklet marketplace. Um, you will then be able to keep the funds in there if you wanted to and then buy an additional Bricklet. Or you might want to diversify and buy other Bricklets that are on the platform uh, as well. So there is no automatic kind of way of reinvesting that money back in there and compounding the number of Bricklets, but you would be able to manage that uh, yourself. Any any thoughts or things you'd wanted to expand on that? Yeah. Um, so unlike uh, a share on, on the ASX, the liquidity of bricklets um, isn't as big. Like there's not a couple of million bricklets, uh, which you'd, you'd, you'd find in terms of shares with the company. Um, so with that, a lot of the time, the company can um, release more shares uh, or they can buy back shares and, and, and do that. Um, we we can't um, produce more bricklets. The the bricklet amount is set, and so there's no dilutions uh, after the um, uh, the initial raise. Um, and so if there's no uh, bricklets on the market, then there's no opportunity to um, re reinvest, pretty much. And so that has to be um, all up to to you to be the fastest person to buy a bricklet, pretty much when it comes out. When it when awesome. Yeah, one comes available. Um, why is the current owner selling? So um, uh, his name's it was John. John's John. on a yeah. John's on a fantastic um, job in terms of um, really building his farming empire. So uh, the story is he he started from next to nothing and and just worked his way up. Um, He's getting to uh, a stage in his life where he has to consolidate all the all his properties, and so he has, I think, twenty or so properties in in the Armadale region. And they're all like, you know, twenty k's away from from this property. Um, so he's selling this property. I don't know his his exact um, uh, situation. He might be um, trying to get rid of some debt. Um, yeah, all, all we know is that he's consolidating um, his assets. Awesome. Uh, cool. I see that Tony's leaving. Um, if you can click the link and book a call with me um, or, or share your phone number, that'll be the best way for us to, to chat. So all the links have been shared when Till was mentioning them throughout the night. I tried to be on top of that as much as I could. Um, and even for the replay uh, later on, we'll pop all those links there. Um, um, will we be regenerating the water? Um, I said yes. And I wanted to you know, maybe see if you wanted to go more into that with natural sequence farming and also the water credits that are available now. Yeah, yeah and, and that too, it's very important that cows and, and cattle, livestock, have high quality, clean water. And so um, so at the moment, they're all drinking out of dams. So there's 58 dams across the property. Uh, I don't think initially we would um, uh, roll out, uh, I guess, um, troughs across the property. That might be too expensive. Um, and so I would be more looking at uh, improving um, the runoff really on, on the property, so making sure that we got enough um, uh, ground cover and um, whatnot to, to filter that water, as well as having re uh, reeds and, and whatnot in, in the dams and, and potentially fencing them off too so they're not the cows aren't going into the, the dams and, and wrecking at all. Um, 
I mean, we won't be using pesticides and, and herbicides and, and whatnot. Uh, and there's there's not much uh, runoff from neighbouring um, uh, farms. And so the water should be pretty good, but, yeah, it's very important to, to make sure it's, yeah. it's high quality. And because we have the flowing creek as well, there's ways of, um, you know, filtering out using reeds and, and natural methods as well. So, um, uh, so there's a bit of discussion in the chat in regards to, um, <clears throat> you know, so will Meta Farms be investing any capital themselves? Um, who gets the carbon credits? Um, and so, um, and the profits from the sale of the original the original cattle. So kind of bundle those questions together. I, I just want to speak to your point as well of if we raised 12 mil to just buy the land, you'd be getting 3% on the 12 mil, but instead you're getting 3% on the 15 mil. Um, so it's a higher return that includes the compensation of the, you know, overheads, I guess, to get started. Um, I personally know that the will be in, um, stocking higher number of cattle and that'll come out of the profits that come from the original herd. Um, but Till, if you want to add more to, you know, where the money's flowing and who's getting the profit, and maybe even explain with the fact that the lease agreement gets reviewed based on the profits. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I guess that money is used to uh, buy cattle. And and so really what, um, I guess in my mind, it's a bit more of a locked up um, uh, funds or capital because so you buy your cattle, you you put some weight on them, sell them, and then you buy more cattle. So, I mean, that that money is going to still be always on the, on the farm. Um, in the case that, so uh, I didn't really talk about it tonight, but uh, potential exit strategies for the farm is to um, uh, say 30 years time, um, there might be a, a, an option for um, to sell the, the property. In that case, we would sell the cattle too, and then that would get distributed to um, the bricklet holders. So that uh, million dollars that goes to cattle will still be given back to um, the bricklet holders at the end of that period. So it's not, we're not going to go take that and, and spend it on Lambo tractors. It's, it's, it's staying on the farm. Mm. And as a group, the, um, the, the good thing about bricklet is that the lease agreement will get put together with all in agreement. So any special clauses that the group would like and any changes in the future as well, the bricklet mod, uh, platform allows queries to be raised and for the community to vote on what changes. So if, you know, the community saw that we were overspending money, you'd be able to raise a, a query to vote that the, the lease agreement got raised. Or if there was some hardship and everyone felt that it was necessary, the, the lease could be reviewed. So the, you know, it's no different than having a landlord and a lease, you know, you ring up and say, hey, we want to do this and can we change these? It all needs to be voted uh, in the majority. So the platform enables all of that. And that's one of the reasons why we prefer the bricklet model over than, you know, buying units in a unit trust is because you have the company constitution, but, you know, th th there's different laws when it comes to, you know, becoming, going into administration and having to solve the company, you know, make the company insolvent. So I don't, I don't want to lose sleep. And like what Till said before would be our worst nightmare if we weren't able to make lease repayments. So, um, you know that 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 is the whole driver that everyone is protected even under um the lease laws and so forth as a tenant if you wanted to you could kick meta farms off and go find a new person you know that's kind of the risk that we're wearing as well if we were to you know be really bad operators yeah you won't, um, you won't find anyone better than us <laughs> yeah we know that too. that's why i can say it because yeah, this is going to be like, you know, uh, 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 you know, the, the opposite of that. We basically want to bust as many myths as we possibly can. Um, someone in the chat said, you know, turn the model upside down. And that's kind of what we really mm. are doing, even with this. It's like it's uncommon um, to do it in a way where we, you know, everyone's on kind of title through a caveat and at least in a, uh, a tenant in common clause to say that everyone's kind of protected the, the property can't be sold banks even can't acquire it without everyone you know being paid out their dues type of thing no different than when you have an easement on your property and you you know they want to come and dig up pipe you know they got to kind of you know they got rights to that land even if you sell it onwards um so and that's really important too for the carbon project because you know those carbon credits will protect, be protected anywhere from 20 to 100 years and our goal with those carbon credits are to make the land value more profitable so in 5 10 15 years time that's locked carbon on the property that's pushing your bricklet prices up 
as um, additional value. Now, as a group, you might decide that you want, you know, we we can um, go and sell those, um, and 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 you know maybe the people in the community want to buy those credits to offset their own personal offset. They're all things that we can talk about and have the discussion in this kind of model. Um, so yeah, that's you know there was you know I think this is why we're just really excited about bringing this kind of model together um, and and. And, and, and making sure that everyone gets their ability to experience this land ownership and these other projects and learn um, together in this. Um, so how does Metafarm makes it makes its money? Um, you know, that what we kind of mentioned before on those slides, you know, through, you know, running classrooms, educational programs, um, you know, farm tours, like people who are part of the Metafarm group will get first access to everything. Um, complementary entry where others will have to then pay. We basically want to get to a point that in like 10 years time, you've benefited more than $15,000 worth of food and events. Yeah, um, extra benefits. That, yeah. So, you know, that you almost be like, this is the, 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 you know, the best return on experience and the ability to access the nutrient dense food and things like that. So, yeah. um, yep. Yeah, um, well, I guess the the, the main uh, income stream for Meta Farms uh, will be cattle operations and, yep. and uh, or just farm operations. So mostly cattle, maybe sheep, uh, maybe chickens. Or, I don't know. Um, diversification would be good. Currently, we're just thinking about cattle for the first couple of years, just because that's what the previous owner has done, and, and I'll have a bit more um, experience with with cattle than sheep and chickens. Cool. Um, will there be an initial cap raise in addition to land purchase uh, and how will this be structured? No. So, so the, the bricklet, um, the money for the bricklet and that's it. There is, there is no extra, um, anything. Um, I guess, I guess, um, we could, uh, we could, um, uh, I guess raise capital through the CSA. So the community supported agriculture in a way, so we can bring forward, um, I guess, our income. So if we needed money, we can bring forward a, a CSA model um, to sell, I guess, beef. Um, so twelve months beforehand. So I get like there's there's options to um, to to raise money, but it won't be through the bricklet thing. If that if that makes sense. Cool. I think that's pretty much all the questions. If I've missed something, feel free to um, pop it in the chat. Yeah. I'm pretty sure we've covered everything. I grouped a couple of them together, though, on the same vein. Um, the average, uh, so, well, the current uh, owner is running uh, about uh, two mil in uh, revenue um, and then, say, one mil in, in costs, so about a mil um, profit. And then, um, but as we said, we want to really expand and bring on a marketing manager um, and expand pretty much this model so we can regenerate, you know, all of Australia. Um, yeah, so we'll be reinvesting that. And plus we have that, um, I, uh, I want to be able to create that uh, safety buffer for a drought um, as soon as possible. So, um, yeah, that's, I guess, where the, uh, the remaining profit will We'll go, and that's that's uh, that profit. Yeah, is before uh, capital expenditure too. So if there's any additional capital expenditures uh, we need to make, that will come out of that that profit. So if we want to go buy another like another tractor or something um, or um, whatever, hmm. we also want to um, work a lot in say the ag tech space and look at ways that we can work smarter on the farm and use. You know, the goal of this farm is really to be a showcase farm. We want people to look into the window of this farm and say, hey, I can do that on my property, whether that using um, um, technology such as drone technology, using sensors to know moisture levels at different parts of the farm, um, you, you know, and, 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 and providing what, what we call the meta farmers, everyone who's investing and who's, um, you know, owning a part of, of this farm, having a dashboard that they can load up and see what the weather's like. There's live cam streaming, um, you know, the ability to really, you know, feel like you're visiting the farm daily if you wanted to without actually physically having to go there. Um, 
So, so there will be a lot of data collected from the farm and that will be to make sure that we can run the farm as efficiently as possible, but also to be a showcase farm. So others go and see that as inspiration. And when Till says regenerate the whole of Australia, it's not just us personally, it's about creating this showcase farm that others see and go, that's what's possible on my farm. Now that I've seen it, I can see the working model. Um, and, and I really do encourage everyone to go and see that Soils for Life case study because it is in the same area as this particular farm and you can see what changes they've done and they've been chemical free for over three years now um, and they're starting to yield profit um, and yields and profit that they've not seen before you know and so this is in the same kind of country a lot of people go oh the New England area it's not not you know great for this but uh, maybe not in the old paradigm you know so we're really excited to inspire as many people to come along on this journey. Yeah. Um, so 3% return on 13 mil is only that uh, a year for bricklets. Um, well, it's, it's 3% return on uh, 14 point, I think, 75, uh, which works out to be, I think, uh, 14, no, uh, 450, I think, thousand a year for bricklets. Um, so the, like the, the remaining 1 mil in, in profit, that is, um, that is our, I guess, reward for taking on uh, the risk. And we need to be able to manage that, uh, those cash flows so that we can sustain the profit um, for longer periods of time. And so when you think about, um, I guess, the risk rewards, the bricklet holders aren't taking as much risk as the uh, the farmer operating the business. And so those returns need to be adjusted for, for those risk factors. Like re realistically, if we're only going to make, you know, a couple of hundred, like only a couple of hundred thousands um, from this. It's not worth all those costs to to operate the business. Um, the so in in those uh, expense um, costs that I shared before, that includes uh, the lease repayments for the brickholders. Um, but yeah, you got you got to think about this as um, what's if if we weren't Meta Farms or if we were someone that we're bringing in to operate the farm, would they be incentivized to actually? run the farm um, and we need to make sure that it's fair on, on everyone's end and, and that we can um, have a functional business because in the, in region ag everyone has a misconception that region ag businesses aren't um, cash flowing or successful and we need to also change that paradigm um, and we can't do that if if you know we're not making any money mm. um uh, what happens if someone wants to sell their bricklet? Um, it, it goes on to uh, like a secondary marketplace. And so you just list your bricklet, say you bought it for um, 15 and a half thousand and it's been a couple of years and you want to sell it for 20,000. You list it for 20,000. Um, the, the key to it is that someone has to be there to buy it. And we expect to be able to build up a bit more of a, um, uh, a audience that we can send an email out and solve a bit more liquidity. Um, so it, it's essentially just listing something on either like the stock exchange, if, if you're familiar with shares or Facebook, like if, if uh, Facebook marketplace, if you have something to sell on Facebook marketplace, you list it, list the price you want it at. Um, and then if someone wants to buy it, they, they buy it. Um, it's, it's just a marketplace really. Um, mm -hmm. uh, have you also considered the impact of foot and mouse? Yes. Um, that is one of the reasons why I want to diversify. There's also a lot of, if you look into Jerry uh, Bonetti's work, um, he, I can't remember, I remember exactly who it is, but he was, he said that there, um, there was a, a case study of a farm where they made sure that the, the, and, uh, the livestock were in such a, um, uh, a condition that they almost came, you know, resistant to foot and mouth. So even if, like, if that's true or not, the report says says it is, and it's good evidence to support that. Making sure that the nutritional um, quality of the feed, and making sure that we have supplementary uh, feeds and minerals to the the cattle's diet, will make them more resistant to uh, disease. Um, I mean, it's a bit hard if the if the government comes in and says everyone's cattle have to die, like they, they all get cold. Um, in that case, there. There will be, um, I guess, a big problem in the area. Uh, the, the location of the farm too is probably a bit more safer than a farm located near um, 
uh, Sydney or um, larger like uh, areas or like Newcastle, for example. So we should be a bit more protected um, from that too. And, and uh, we'll also have a quarantine paddock too. So, yeah, we'll be taking lots of um, biosecurity measures to make sure that, yeah, we don't wipe out all, all the cattle. Mm. Mm. Um, where do the appreciation benefits lie? Ooh, I guess if it's, uh, well, I guess with the uh, bricklet holders, well, I'll have to talk to Darren about that. Um, I'm not too sure how exactly that works but i guess yeah if if say the, the shed depreciates then then that would be owned by the bricklet owners um but if like we buy a tractor and that depreciates that'd be a, that would be a business um thing right what do you, what do yeah, you reckon i would i would assume so um because all the fixed assets that are on the farm they probably wouldn't have a depreciation schedule because of their age so i think everything would probably be already out of that um but yeah again don't know Exactly. There doesn't seem to be any newish infrastructures there. Um, but yeah, again, if it's part of the original settlement, like what's there, um, you know, I think actually maybe the house has got an upgraded kitchen. Uh, so there may be an existing depreciation schedule there already um, based on uh, improvements on the house that's possibly happened. There's two houses there. Um, so that would apply on the, the bricklet owners because that's part of the house settlement. But building a new shed or, in, you know, putting solar panels on or something like that, that would come out of the Meta Farms business unit and then the appreciation, depreciation, risks, liability or, or stay in that insurance and whatnot. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But again, you know, we, we can clarify that as well. And th these are the reasons why we're holding these information um, sessions is to create these feedback loops. Like we we couldn't say that we're learning out loud, um, you know, together. And we're, we're trying to showcase this new way of thinking about owning property and real estate. It's not just farmland. Like Bricklet's been doing this for, for a long time now, you know, ho, ho, you know buying apartments and shopping centres. Um, and I guess some more of the people who don't have a lot of capital are looking at this as a way of getting into the property market for 15, 20, 25K. Um, and 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 parking their money there, so it's not diminishing in bank accounts, you know. And most long, you know, term deposits aren't even paying three percent at the moment, mm -hmm. um, you know. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. And if it is, you have to lock it up for five years, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah. Someone did mention something before about buying them. Like, can you share the bricklet? If you wanted to come up with a mutual agreement between two parties um, and buy a bricklet together, you're more than welcome to do that. But the legality and kind of the agreement and the handshake uh, needs to sit outside of bricklet. Um, but there is no reason why you couldn't get two friends together and buy, you know, half a bricklet each uh, and buy one. Uh, but it would need to be put in one person's name. One person needs to identify it and the agreement of that needs to be between you two. Uh, and the other thing that we didn't really mention is you can buy bricklets through self-managed super funds. So if you've got money sitting there in super, that's not kind of doing anything. You can use your super to buy the bricklets in a self-managed super fund. The only caveat there is your normal self-managed super fund things apply that if you sell it for a profit, it needs to stay in the self-managed super fund. Um, but that could be another way of diversifying your money, especially with the fact that share markets are dropping 20, 30% lately, um, you know, and land prices ain't. So that's something that you might want to explore uh, as well with self-managed super funds. The other thing as well is that there is a lender that will lend to help you buy bricklets as well. So again, you have to come up with your own um, uh, loan with them. Um, they're a credit union, but they will help um, you buy part of the bricklet, but then you will owe them the money like a normal personal loan. Um, so that's another option as well. If you're really keen, but don't have the whole capital, um, you could you could do that. Yeah. Um, farming lease is three percent, and lease you bring and pay for their own cattle. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I understand that usually. So we're paying three percent on um the I guess the one mill used for uh, the cattle. Um, I mean, if if you're not comfortable with that, don't buy a bricklet. And I, I mean, it's not it's a bit harsh to say. Um, we could also easily take that out as a, like a, a fee or a meta farm fee. Um, uh, we're paying a 3% return on that and it's stored in uh, the value of the bricklet. So when, when if in time uh, we sell, like the, the property sells and um, so 30 years time, every, like sell the, the property, 
the, the cattle will sell too, and that that would go to the bricklet um, holders. Also, um, ten uh, percent is a pretty good overall return. Um, we will be force, pre- uh, force appreciating the um, farmland with regen ag practices. So we could we could easily um, charge a consulting fee. Um, uh, I'm not, yeah, not too sure. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I understand yeah. that usually, yeah. Yeah, the only point I'll make as well on that matter is if we were to acquire the cattle that is currently on the farm, and the sale price was 15 million because we we're also acquiring the, the cattle. It'd be no different to that. So the 1 million that's been allocated for the cattle will always be seen as part of the you know bench line um, of what the what is kind of belonging to the meta um to, to the bricklet owners. And so if we would ever go below that or needed to de stock down to zero, that needed to stay as an asset to the bricklets. Um, and not be spent by the Meta Farms unit. So no different than if the, the, the cattle were being purchased off the current land of the owner um, and part of the purchase price, which we don't want because uh, there's no quality control because he really is buying low-quality cattle and beefing them up. Um, so, yeah. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's... It, um, it's not all about making profit, but I mean, if um, it is a exchange of value, like if, if you're um, uh, buying a, a property and, and using that capital to to purchase a property, it's more than fair to to um, you know make a bit of money on that too. Um, I don't, yeah, like that's it's good. Uh, I think someone said something about bees. Um, I think with Rona might uh, actually bees would be uh, a good one to diversify as well for a smaller um cash flow mm. um yes pat yep we first in line five shares and metafarm so um make sure to uh follow those three steps that we shared before so funding up uh the account uh you met um your bricklet account um oh yeah yeah Rachel. links in the chat yep yeah yep. um if M and uh, uh, foot and mouth comes through and cattle have been destroyed, who is compensated? If livestock has to be destroyed, um, well, it, so it's a thousand dollars worth of cattle owned, I guess, by the bricklet holders. So million dollars. Um, in which case, um, I guess we would be if all cattle are destroyed and there's nothing in the bank, and also I guess that's also to that drought fund. But say we buy cattle the next day. Um, they all have to be culled. Then we'll have to be we'll have to look at um, uh, additional sources of um, yeah bringing capital. But also, um, uh, actually, no, that wouldn't work if all, all the cattle were just. I was going to say just just meant for short for a short time, but um, yeah. it's very hard to cover all the what ifs. And I think it's really important that, um, you know, they're, they're raised, but, you know, there's also the massive what if that it doesn't ever come here, um, which would be the best opt Because, you know, I guess mm. if it did hit us, we wouldn't be the only ones affected. I think everyone would be more worried about how they're going to feed themselves and do other things and lots of other things, um, you know. So, uh, yeah, I think it's definitely a stone that doesn't does, does need to be unturned and, and questioned. Um, and, you know, there are insurances, maybe some of them won't cover uh, now that it's um, kind of known, but um, business insurance is definitely something that is required. Um, and, um, and you know, we're very resourceful. I definitely have no doubt that we wouldn't be able to, um, you know, yeah, create revenue from the business, uh, from the land in order to keep afloat. Yep, one on. I think, Kay, that is a great idea to do a one-on-one. In fact, you'll get a two-on-one because Till and I will both be there. <laughs> yeah. um, so this is the link to book the call. It's um, not on the website yet. Um, we just wanted everyone to like see this webinar first before we then start doing the one-on-one bookings and make sure that everyone in the webinar um, was a priority of getting those calls. But over the next week or so, we'll be opening um, the expression of interest and the booking um, and to get, get started to the wider masses. So um, that includes the Bricklet Network as well and some of the um, other corporate groups that have been interested in what we're doing um, as a bit of a showcase farm. Everyone's very interested in this kind of innovation. I think that's what we really need to keep the focus on is that 
we're kind of at the start of something really exciting and and this could potentially become the way that farm is owned and keeping it to Australians. So Till mentioned before another company called Acre Traders, really awesome business model. They basically go around and save farms from closing down and owned by, you know, sophisticated investors, but they you have to be American and they've actually bought a couple of Australian land holdings, you know, but all the owners are 100% American. Um, and so we're trying to be that company that enables this to happen here so we can keep the land in Australia owned by Australians. Yeah, um, you know, if we all chip right. in, we can we can hold a lot of the land together, you know. Mm. And, and still allow these farmers, which um, in any other case, they might lose their farm, still give them an option to maintain uh, a bit of equity and continue farming their their um their properties so it's yeah i mean it's a um it's a great way to bring value to to everyone awesome well cool. we're getting close to the two hour mark so thank you very much for everyone for sticking over over time um till amazing um one <laughs> hour no breath i don't even think i saw you breathe mate so <laughs> um, you know yeah so hopefully everyone could see that you know till's done a lot of number crunching and got spreadsheets everywhere and um, him and I have sat down over a computer many times and, you know, is this crazy to you? I'm like, no, that makes sense. And I'll maybe check this. So we've, you know, kind of done the best we possibly can, but we want to open and invite others to share their knowledge as well. So, mm. you know, if you want to book a call, the link's there, we jump on a Zoom, we can share screen, we can crunch numbers together. Um, we want everyone to feel extremely supported through this process. Uh, when we live in this world of high tech, we want to also keep on with a high touch um, and that's why we're running these webinars and offering, you know, personal calls. Um, so, yeah. On that note, Till, any final words or anyone else want to pop in the chat? Otherwise, let's let everyone get to bed, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> so, well, uh, yeah. i got a long time to travel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, well, awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll see you all um, next time. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for coming along. We will get the replay out to you in the next 24 hours, along with all the slides and the links. So until next time, get outside, get your hands dirty, and keep digging deeper into our wonderful world of soil. Thanks, everyone. Good night.